so like we said before, and this might be a better picture of it, we talked about yesterday how the upper fibers of the trapezius have almost no function based <coughs> on the fact that they have no mechanical advantage, the muscles are very, very thin, uh, it's mostly fascial tissue, there's not a whole lot of contractile tissue in the upper trapezius as per the research by Bogduct, I can't remember the year that it was published, but it was quite a while ago. And when you consider the function that we think the, the upper trapezius has, which is to raise the shoulder girdle, you, you're going to require muscles that are a lot stronger in order to do that. Why is that? It's because the shoulder girdle is pretty much suspended in space by one articulation, which is the sternocostal joint. Okay? That's pretty much the only hinge that we have to hold up that entire shoulder girdle. So the weight of the entire arm, the weight of the scapula, the scapular muscles, um, the weight of the clavicle, all of that is held up in that one joint. So in order to lift that joint, we're going to need a muscle, muscles which are a lot more uh, mechanically inclined to do so. And the upper trapezius just doesn't serve that purpose. Not to say that the upper trapezius isn't important. We talked about how that paper-thin muscle can adhere to the posterior cervical musculature, like the levator scapula. It's just not the best biomechanically advantageous muscle to cause the lifting of the shoulder girdle. And we also talked about how people really seem to understand that bulk in this area as being the upper trapezius, but in this area, the trapezius is more like a flat, um, paper-like muscle sitting on top of that bulk. Now, what's that bulk made of? A lot of the bulk is made of simply by the, the contour of the shoulder, um, which could be uh, attributed to the change in direction by the rhomboid, which we're going to get to. So you have this kind of flat surface, and then you have the rhomboid, which kind of changes direction. So you get this uh, protrusion in this area here. A lot of that bulk is also made by the middle trapezius, uh, which I will not claim to be uh, a useless muscle or, or not mechanically advantageous. A lot of that bulk that you see in this region here is the middle trapezius. As per the definition, the middle trapezius is, are the fibers which are going almost horizontal, as opposed to the upper trapezius, which are the fibers which are going uh, almost strictly vertical, which is why people get confused. So the middle trapezius does have bulk, and the middle trapezius sits on top of the uh, supraspinatus as well, which can also puff up that area. Um, another muscle that has a lot of function is the lower trapezius, and we have the lower trapezius contributing significantly uh, to scapular stability uh, and to keeping that scapula pasted down to the thoracic cage and keeping that scapula in place as you have abduction of the glenohumeral joint. So we've talked about palpating the, the um, superior or uh, upper trapezius. Now let's talk a little bit about palpating that middle and inferior trapezius, which is our reference structure. With each other, one thing I will say is clinically, a lot of times people have that pain out in this region here, which almost everyone wants to diagnose as a uh, costal vertebral joint sprain. Funny thing about Articulations, we always want to blame an articulation. So anytime there's pain in this region, we're always going to automatically say that the costal transverse joint is restricted. And anytime there's some kind of posterior neck pain, we're also always going to conclude that the facet joint is restricted or we're having a facet syndrome. But if you have a true facet syndrome like we talked about yesterday, that Kemp's type maneuver, and I won't even call it a, 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 an orthopedic examination, just the, the idea of trying to look to that side is going to be painful if you have a hot facet. Similarly, if you sprain your costal transverse joint, the costal transverse joint is a very little joint. If that joint's injured, breathing is going to be very painful. That's just how it is. If you spring onto the ribs, it's going to be very painful. If when the person takes a very deep breath, if you brace their ribs, it's going to be less painful. Those are all indications that you have a costal transverse joint sprain. But if you don't have those findings, then you probably don't have a costal transverse joint sprain. It's like if you're looking at the knee and you think something's sprayed, then you do a valgus test and nothing hurts and nothing's loose, you probably don't have a medial collateral ligament sprain. So in this case, there's a lot of things in this area that can cause, that can cause pain. Uh, myofasciopathy or uh, fibrosis, for example, in the um, uh, iliocostalis, if you move the we're going to get to the iliocostalis, but if you move the scapula laterally, this, uh, there's a muscle right in this region here called the iliocostalis, which can be very, very painful, and it can mimic the pain that is associated with rib sprains. 
Also, that inferior trapezius muscle, if you palpate that inferior trapezius muscle, that can also reproduce a lot of the pain, especially as it comes into that insertion onto the uh, uh, root of the spine of the scapula. Now, don't get confused because that's one of those spots where almost everyone will have pain if you look hard enough. So if I start to roll this here, he's not going to tell you that that feels uh, really good. So like we always talk about, pain on palpation is not a useful clinical finding unless it reproduces the, the pain symptomatology that the person is presenting with. Okay?